in the Who Marmont's the belly. Who the fuck is Alo Lophand? And the world went mad. Who the fuck are you, Alo Lophand? <laughs> What up, and welcome to another episode of Brotherhood Without Manners, your favorite full spoiler reread podcast of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series. I'm Nate. Joining me, as always, is my brother and co-host, the one, the only, the Zach. Yo. You're the Zach. That's me. I guess. I mean, I suppose there's other Zachs, so you're one of the Zachs. That's pretentious. I'm not, I'm, I was going to go along and say you have to start calling me that and refer to me as the, but I don't want to be called the Zach. Yeah, I know. I'm douchey. You are kind of a douche. If you've joined us before, we are so grateful you've come back for another episode. If you haven't been here, we're full spoiler, and we read Song of Ice and Fire series by George Martin, which mm-hmm. I just said. Did mm-hmm. I just say that? I think mm-hmm. I said that. Mm-hmm. Last episode, we read some Tyrion. That was fun. Yeah, Tyrion was dealing with some singers, trying to get them out of the city, and then telling Bronn to kill them, and as well as dealing with his father, telling him to find money for both the royal, royal wedding and to fix the riverfront that was decimated during Blackwater. Rebuild King's Landing. And yeah. Tyrion's not liking it, but he, for some reason, thinks that he's improving and kind of following in his foot, father's footsteps, thinking that he, about the singer and having him killed, whereas he should have had, like, Jano Slint, for example, killed. Right. And uh, he's wrong. He's very wrong, and Tyrion's kind of in this slow, steady decline that he has been in since the beginning of this book. And it's only going to keep going on through to the end of Dr- Dance. But, Where the uh, fuck are we? Dance with Dragons? That's the one that's out right now. Yeah, that. Yeah. We mm-hmm. know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Much more interesting, I think, than Tyrion's whining. We're reading Sam 2 today. Yes. And Sam 1? Sam 1 is a doozy. The Fist? Of the, uh, the Fleeing of the, the Fist, fleeing, yeah. Right. Um, and the Slaying of the White Walker. And the Slaying of the White Walker for the first time in thousands of years. Tens of thousands, if the, the stories are to be true. Right. So, yeah, the Night's Watch was fleeing the Fist of the First Men as the others had attacked, and it was terrifying. People were going missing in the dark, and you could just hear the screams. Sam didn't want to continue forward, got carried for a while by Small Paul. And then I believe Small Paul died. Froze to death yeah. out there. He couldn't and carry on. And then anymore. Sam and Gran ran into another, and Sam just in panic, shitting himself, fear, ended up killing it with dragon glass. And it's been a hot minute since we've been with Sam. Yeah, and this and, is only Sam too. And so we pick back up as I, I really actually like. It this. opens with a juxtaposition right off the bat with the, the life and death cycle. The screaming of a woman, which I think is interesting. First of all, that he's saying a woman, not named Gilly, right? giving birth up top, while down below he's taking care of Bannon. That's his name, Bannon, yeah. uh, who's covered by just a mound of furs, trying to keep him warm because he took an injury to his leg, and it's it's not healing well, man. Yeah, Sam is not sure which frightens him more, the woman up in the loft giving birth and screaming or Bannon dying. He's trying to spoon in some onion broth, but Bannon can't even swallow at this point. And Craster has, at this point, said that he's most mostly dead already, and it'd just be kinder to finish him off. And Giant's like, yeah, but we didn't ask your fucking permission, bro. No. So, chill. Here's where I find this, this weird already, because... Obviously, Craster's a disgusting person. He holds the same belief right there that Arya would. This guy deserves mercy. He's clearly dead. Yeah. L- end it for him. Stop his suffering and end it. And he says that, granted, in not a nice way. Yeah, it's not about stopping the suffering. It's about why waste the broth. Right, and the, the cloths and the space right. in the room and anything else like Yeah, that. it's the but inconvenience to Craster. And it's just interesting. Yeah, Giant uh, Giant gives Craster the, the right amount of shit that he should, and Craster begins bitching about the crows, as he does, but... Sam basically boils it down to Bannon needs a maester, and they have no fucking maester. They had uh, a healing herbs. Brown Benar had brought healing herbs with them, but Benar died on the fist. And Yeah, anyone that knows their way around herbs or plants or even, like I mentioned, a cook, it doesn't matter. They're all dead at this point, so they have nobody that can help this guy. And the whole vibe of this chapter is pretty sketchy. There's just Black Brothers kind of spread out everywhere as this as Gilly's up in the loft giving birth, and you can feel the the tension as men are grumbling about Crestor made an interesting quote in this where he said, when did a black bird ever bring good man, good news to a man's hall? And I just thought that was another interesting... Again, all these, I think, 
truths that were the read as the reader refused to believe their truths because they're being delivered by Craster. But who well, here I don't, knows? I don't think it's that. But right, like Craster worships these things, and it's his sons that are. Becoming just, the yeah, white to me, it's like he he has a lot more information than right. people give him credit for. It's just for. filtered through a dirty, racist, fucking racist southern piece fog, of shit yeah. type deal. Yeah, southern. <laughs> uh, sorry, that slipped out. <laughs> and uh, Clubfoot <laughs> Carl had been kind of keeping the shit going amongst the Black Brothers, Black Brothers yep, by. I- Saying, talking about a hidden larder and all this shit. Yeah. And Garth of Old Town began echoing him, and of course, this was all out of Lord Commander Mormont's hearing. Yeah, on this analytical reread, it's it's crazy to me how many of the people that spur the mutiny are just randos who yeah. are like no, not really big named people throughout the Night's Watch who go off on, which it makes sense that way, but it's I never really considered it that like. These aren't the 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 grant because we've only been around all the people surrounding Mormont, the trustable, trustable, trusting, trustworthy men in the Night's Watch. Uh, so it's it's cool to see these terrible people kind of doing these things that you never hear of. Yeah, Martin did a great job with this chapter because you can just feel it's Dance. it's gonna pop at some point during this chapter. It just builds and builds and builds. And Sam is dead tired as well, but whenever he closes his eyes now, all he sees is blowing snows and dead men coming towards him, all black hands and bright blue eyes. Terrifying. Yeah, he also worries that Craster knows that he spoke with Gilly because he feels like every single time he looks at him, he's clenching his fists, grinding his teeth. That's that's just fucking Craster. Man. Yeah, yeah, Craster at this point gives a... Perfect example of why he's a piece of shit telling Gilly basically that she can be quiet in pregnancy or he's going to come up there and fucking duff her. Right. Which he's a fantastic person. And then, yeah, Sam thinks of his first meeting with her and thinks how he wishes he could help her because it was her baby she had feared for when she had asked him to ask Yo, John. Yo, Craster said that he saw a fucking cow give birth to like six calves quiet, with li- no, le- no more than a grunt. Fuck you, you terrible, terrible person. You fucking... God, that pissed me off when I read that. And so Sam tosses another blanket on top of Bannon, and as Craster begins to compare Sam to a fat sow that he once had, Sam begins to head outside because he's had enough. The weather had lessened, so it's not bitter cold, but... The Black Brothers go about their chores, chopping wood, walking so, patrols. as he was leaving, Sam, there was... He, the quote, the way that Martin wrote it was that he reminds himself that he's a guest here in Craster's home. And so I think that's the hinting, the, the beginning of the, we in this chapter, we've pointed it out a couple times, guest right, making its prominence throughout this book. And this is the time that we're going to see it just fucking flipped on its end. That One they of the were, first times in this book. Right, book, right. It's flipped on its end. And... So I think that was one of the the main points to highlight with Martin was using his phrasing there, where we're guests here, like we have to obey by his rules because that's what that's how it yeah works. that's that's the moniker his roof his rules right. keeps getting repeated over and over. Gilly is his, and then Sam thinks that there had been no attacks since they had arrived at Craster's, neither whites nor others. Is there a reason for that? Do you think is there a perimeter around Craster's? Um. I, it wouldn't surprise me because that's what I was thinking is that like the cold won't come here right unless it's unless asked, it's picking up a unless child they're saying they're picking right. up a, a token and, of and his... I, that's gonna uh, something I was gonna bring up later anyway when Craster's saying you know I'm a godly man well that's I have right to here fear. that's right this next bit is yeah. him claiming that he's a godly man and there is no cause to fear such he told Mance Raider that as well. And that, I think, is very interesting. I would have loved to have seen the Crasser and Mance conversation because I feel like Mance would have at least listened and been able to read between the lines a little bit better. Right, and we knew, we do know from the last uh, from a chapter, it might have been the last book, that Mormont's aware that he sacrifices these boys mm-hmm. to the, the White Walkers. Yeah, he serves crueler gods and than so you or I will ever understand. I think even Sam understands that, yes, there is a a quote-unquote protection. I'd call it more of a truce than a protection. I don't know if Sam understands it. I think think we, the readers, He's aware and he's pissed off that Mormont knows about the fact that the boys are given up as sacrifices. I don't think Sam has still even put it together that the whites are the ones snatching that shit up, but... 
Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a protected area so much as it is, like I said, a truce where they don't go there because he gives the children. That's what the deal is. He's safe from them because he's offering up something that they want. And he tells them that fire won't help when the white cold comes. Only the gods will help you then. Which I think is interesting that he doesn't mention anything about Dragon Glass. Right. Like, obviously, I don't think they would tell him that Sam killed the white, but, you know, maybe he doesn't know about Dragon Glass at all. So I believe it's very much so a Craster believes that he is in much better standing than he is. For sure. And I think he's tolerated because he gives them children, and when the time comes for them to sweep down oh, yeah, through, there's no he would have been obliterated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is when Sam comes upon Sweet Donnell and Ulmer competing at some archery, and Ulmer was a former member of the Kingswood Brotherhood, we learn. Kingswood Brotherhood, yeah, that just sounded weird. And he uh, was taught by Fletcher Dick how to shoot arrows, sure. which Fletcher Dick is a very famous archer and sung about, yada, yada, yada. Every brother had heard the tale multiple times. And they want Sam the Slayer to show them how he slayed the others. So, I like, again, Martin, the way he lays out his chapters, because we know that the next chapter is Arya with the Hound and Beric Dondarrion fighting. And that's a very big moment for the Brotherhood Without Banners. And they're very much the modern day in this version of the, the Kingswood Brotherhood there. These outlaws who are fighting for the people currently and mm. and so for them to bring it up in so much detail with the different people that were in it almost these mirrors of you know Angai being the you know Fletcher Dick and having these different representations back then of the same style group roaming the Riverlands. Right, Jamie Lannister has referenced the Kingswood Brotherhood a few times he, there were some of the outlaws he fought and so yeah the I thought it was neat that we get a little bit of that up here as well but uh yeah, Sam tells them that it was a dagger, not an arrow, and he knows basically what they're trying to do. He'll miss the shot, and then they'll all fucking laugh at him. So he turns to leave, and of course, because the, the world is cruel, his boot gets stuck in the mud, and so they laugh at him anyway, and he thinks, useless, my father saw me true, I have no right to be alive when so many brave men are dead. So he's got a little bit of... Uh, PTSD about the situation. Survivor's Survivor guilt. Skill there, yeah. uh, he's, he's not assuming useless. that John's dead, man. The ravens have served their purpose. They have gotten and raised the alarm, as we know. Tywin and them received, received the letter right. saying, Bowen Marsh is terrified that Mormont is dead. Spoiler alert, he fucking is. So, like, it all t- kind of worked out great, anyway, right? Is the best measure is because of the fact that... Well, that Tywin is. Well, if, in... in for but his the sake. Bowen Marsh is and the wall is. Like, well, just Tywin. meaning that Tywin is aware that, oh, well, if Jor Mormont's dead, then this is what's happening. So for the House Lannister, he's taking the best course of action. Yeah, fuck Tywin. Uh, <laughs> it was mainly Sam got the ravens out, and so he didn't fail, and he survived and killed another. And he finds Gren splitting Gren. wood, and Gren breaks it down, but very simply explains that Sam should just fucking own the Slayer nickname. Like, you did kill one. And he's like, Sam's like, but they say it to mock me. And, and it was the dragon glass that did it, not me. But yeah. And he's like, so what, though? You actually did do it. I get called Orux by shitty people. And yeah, it sucks. But it's A, just a name. B, if you or John called me that, there's also good things about Oryx being big, strong animals, not dumb, fucking slow animals. So... Find the positives, dude. Yeah, Sam had told them all about the encounter. Some didn't believe him, but Dywin had listened, and to Ed. And then they made him tell Mormont, and Mormont listened through it all with a very stern face, and then asked Sam for all the dragon glass he had, which was little enough. And when he thinks now of the cash that he found at the Fist of the First Men that is left there, he absolutely just wants to weep because there was a For lot. Sure. He doesn't have much of that cash. Yeah, that's a lot of dragon glass that would have been helpful during all of this shit. Yeah, they're down to two daggers and 19 arrowheads and one dragon glass spear, and Sam knows it will not be enough. I like that Gren kind of played the role of Tyrion to John at the beginning of Game of Thrones, saying, like, oh, and you're, you're a bastard. Yeah, but use that as your armor. Don't let that be the what defeats you. Yeah, Gren's killing it this yeah, chapter. Gren's like, a badass. Absolutely. And uh, Sam also thinks that the fist was way more defensible than Craster's, and there's only 41 of them now anyway. 
And he wishes John were here, but then wonders if John is dead somewhere, lying frozen in some ravine, or worse, walking. Which, uh... Ouch. That's, that's silly in a lot of ways, like, with the fact that he is walking currently, <laughs> and he's down south of the wall, or going to be in, uh, you know, another few hours. And so it's that, plus the fact that one day he will die and come back, we're fairly certain. In a cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. finally the fact that he's worrying about being attacked from the outside and being underprepared when you're about to be attacked from the inside yeah. and be even more unprepared. He Sam thinks, why would the gods take Jon Snow and Bannon and leave him? And thinks again that he should have died on the fist. And this is when Mormon's crow comes approaching, calling out Snow, which of course it is. And then Mormont arrives soon after, and again we get the mention of the ram skull and the bear skull, which is more indication that Mormont is fucking dead this For chapter. Sure. And Kras- uh, Mormont's like, We're, we need to leave. We gotta get the fuck out. Yeah, Kras- 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 is not made having it, us here Made it anymore. clear. So he calls Sam over and tells him to come with him, and Mormont's been thinking about this dragon glass of his and how every man on the wall should be armed with a dagger the day he says his words, and... Sam's like, well, we didn't know, and Mormont's like, right, but we once must have known, and the Night's Watch has forgotten its true purpose. We've lost sight of the true enemy, and now he's here, and we don't know how to fight him. And Mormont wants more dragonglass, which... I was thinking about when Sam was telling the story to Mormont about him killing the the white with the dragonglass, and that there is no doubt in my mind that Mormont would 100% believe him because of all the interactions we've seen with Sam and Mormont. He's not going to lie. He can the, barely yeah. talk to the guy. Right. If he looks at him, Sam's pissing his pants. And so, yeah, to be standing in front of Mormont, having him be like, what happened? I killed another. Even if Sam <laughs> was lying, Mormont would know immediately. Unless all of a sudden this guy grew the biggest backbone and went little finger cold all of a sudden. And so I love that Mormont's like, we need to find more of this shit. We need to find out where we lost the information because it's got to be around somewhere. We need to get on this now. Craster's emergence from his tent interrupts them and he declares that he has a son. And Mormont's like, well... You know, best wishes for you. I'm very happy. And he says that it's past time the crows leave. And then that's dying. Either cut their throats and be done with it or leave them and I'll sort them out myself. And this is when Thor and Smallwood kind of bristles and said, you cl- uh, or, or Mormont says, Thor and Smallwood claimed you were a friend to the Watch. And Craster says, I gave, I gave you what I could, dude. Like, fuck off. And now I have another squalling mouth to feed, which, God, Craster. He's not even going to feed the thing. Right. And it says, we could take him, someone squeaked. Shit, Sam. In Sam's own POV, it's someone squeaked. Like, Sam doesn't even believe that. He doesn't even recognize that that it was him that said It's himself speaking up in this situation. Craster, of course, begins to lose his shit spitting on Sam's boot. And Mormont gives Sam the business, telling him to shut the fuck up and get inside. And then scold Sam, telling him, like, what are we going to do with the babe? It's going to be dead before we get to the wall, dude. So, like, go deal with Bannon before I fucking strangle you right now. Because sure. we don't need Craster getting fucking riled up right now. He's already prickly as pissing fuck. on us to leave and pushing us out the fucking door. But Bannon's dead. Bannon dead. Guy's gone. So they spend the evening until nightfall. Well, they the, the brothers the argue. They said that he was... Because it was his, uh, he lost the a foot. leg. But they were like, no, I've known people that have lost a foot and had no problem recovering from that he shit He was whatsoever. never fed, not proper. Craster starved him to death. And then they begin talking about the larder again and all the hidden shit he must have. And then, yeah, they burned his corpse at sunset in Gren's fire pit, actually. And his belongings were divided among the brothers. And Mormont says some words, but... Doesn't know him. Doesn't know him. And so, yeah, it's very much the... he. He was a man with two ears. Did he have both both hands? And he became a Night's Watch member. And then one in one of the darker scenes from the book, Sam begins to smell the corpse cooking and thinks it smells not so different from pork. 
and how delicious that would be, which makes him hungry, which makes him run to puke. Which then makes it so he can't eat any of the wonderful feast that's prepared for them now. But as he's puking, Ed joins him for a quick piss and agrees that Bannon smelled good enough to eat and also (laughs) reports that they'll be riding at first light. And he also does the great fucking quip of, like, you know, now at this point, like, being even being dead isn't going to be enough. They're going to be like, oh, I know you're dead, Ed, but you still got to get up and shovel this horse shit. I like, just put great Ed jokes here. Yeah, he, he kills it in <laughs> this little. It. And kind of brings, I think, Sam back to a little bit of fucking normalcy of, for the moment. But it also brings us to dinner. Where Craster's pleased that they're dipping, yeah. so he's, yeah, going to feast them. them Sam more. cannot eat because he's still thinking about <laughs> pork bannon, you know. Yeah. With a little extra relish. He does manage to eat an onion, cutting off some of the rot, and has some. Yes. The rot. Um, Wasn't there Melisandre. a chapter with Mel yeah. where she... You I cut eat. away the rot, it's, you know, it, or it, if it, a half an onion is rotten, it's, it's still, still a rotten, rotten onion. And Sam just passively, oh, that part's rotten? That's okay, I'm right. going to eat the good part. And shows that that's completely untrue, go fuck yourself, yeah. Mel. Anyway. Trouble starts when only two loaves of bread are offered. Clubfoot Carl is not having it. And Mormont basically tells Carl to take what's given and be thankful. But Carl says he would rather eat what Craster has hidden away. And this is where Dirk begins to join in. And Carl calls Craster a liar. And then others begin to take the call for food. And Mormont is, like, losing control and tells them all to stop this. This is folly. And Carl tells Mormont that if he doesn't want to hear it, to stuff bread in his ears, or did you already eat your morsel? Oh. And that's when Mormont stands up saying, Watch your tongue, boy. Remember who the fuck you're addressing. I'm your commander. I could have you fucking killed for that. And so no one speaks or moves for a minute. And Carl starts to sit down sullenly. But then Craster stands with his axe in hand, and he tells them all to get out, to go sleep in the cold with empty bellies. Well, especially Clubfoot Carl. Well, yeah, he, he says, points no one out who the calls ones me who a were, coward who are talking gets shit. to sleep in my roof. And that's when Garth chimes in and is like, nah, like, you're, fuck you, dude. You're gross and terrible. Where's the hogs? Like, we saw that you had pigs hidden around last time we were here. Where's all that? You've got food for us. Someone calls out bastard, and Carl <sighs> confirms it by saying, you are a bastard. Eee. And Craster rushes at Carl. Doesn't make it as Dirk grabs Craster by the back of his head and opens his throat. Yeah. During which Mormont begins screaming that they'll be cursed, bringing murder into a man's hall. And then Dirk grabs one of Craster's wives and begins threatening her for the food. And as that happens, uh, Mormont steps forward to prevent that from happening. Oof. When little was it? Alo Lophand. Garth of Greenway and Alo Lophand block him both with blades drawn, and as Mormont goes to pull away... Lophand fucking kills Lophand him. Lophand turns him around and shoves his knife into Who Mormont's belly. Who the fuck belly. is Allo Lophand? And the world went mad. Who the fuck are you, Allo Lophand? Uh, that's, I think, intentionally... Like, we've heard uh, his name pop up, I think, on this journey, but I think that's intentional, is that's how... It hurts so much more that way. It's no one of significance. Go fuck yourself, You know, Allo. if it was fucking Diwin, at least you'd Ollie, be like, oh, Allo. that makes a little sense. Apparently it's all the alls, man. So, and also the description that, like, the world went mad as soon as he, Sam yeah, kind of awesome. loses it. Much later, Sam sat cradling Mormont's head in his lap. Garth Greenway had killed Garth of Old Town, though Sam can't remember why. Gren had shouted and slapped Sam and then telling him to run, and then he ran with Giant and Ed and some others. Four of the crows sat on benches eating while Olo raped a woman on the table. In what fucking world? In Are you going to just sit there and eat? Is that, like, appealing? Like right. some dude raping a chicken. You know what sounds good is some fucking bread and a little side of rape. Like, dinner in a show. Yeah, right. I'm going to sit down with my fucking dinner and put on a porn because that's what I want to watch while I'm engaging in a fucking decent meal, let alone it being on the actual tape. Like, the, the just disgusting nature of these people is, like, so blatantly revealed that I almost thought it was a little over the top of, like... Man, he's not even up in the fucking loft, like, right on the table where they're eating, and they're fine with it, like... They're just eating. What a bizarre fucking picture, man. I mean, I understand that they're open, you know, like, a lot of times soldiers sleep nude together and shit, they fuck in front of each other, they shit and piss in front of each other, but... during dinner? 
during dinner, right? Like that's a little, <laughs> especially over after the top. they've all been bitching about how hungry they are, right? And so Mormont commands Sam to get to the wall. Go tell them everything. This, the fists, j- everything. Wildlings, dragon, dragon glass, glass, all. And then tell my son Jora, take the black. My dying wish. And Sam is so tired, and he sells that to Mormont. He's like, I'm not afraid anymore. I'll just sit here with you. If I just wait long enough, someone will get angry with him and kill him and put him out of his misery, which is fucking dark, man. And the then there are Craster's wife, three so. of Craster's wives standing over him. One of which is Gilly. Two older and Gilly with her babe. And she, uh, one of the older ones says that the blackest crows are gouging themselves gorging themselves down in the larder or up in the loft with the young ones, but they'll be back soon. Best you be gone when they do. We've got you some horses. Daya's caught two horses. Take her and go. And he's like, but Mormont, they're like, look, he's he's uh, he's dead when you looked away. Child, that old crow is gone before you. And Sam looks, and indeed he is. So Sam closes like, his eyes. You made a promise to get her out of here. Look at the chaos. Take that. Go. You take his sword. You take that big warm fur cloak, and you go. And Sam asks where, and they say someplace warm. At the same time, the two women say that. And Gilly says that she'll be Sam's wife if if he takes her. He's a boy, and if you don't take him, they will. And Sam says they. And the old woman answers, huh. "The boy's brothers, Craster's sons." And then she says, "I have old bones. These old bones don't lie. I can predict the weather." They'll be here soon, the sons. And that's the end of Sam 2. That's a really fucking ominous way, and that has to come back, right? There has to be significance to these being Craster's sons. Um, I mean, I don't know necessarily significance. As Is it literally just fluffing their army? That, that's kind of where I'm at, where I think it's just that, just getting numbers. The fact that they're, um, I feel as though living... And being turned makes them more likely to be what the white, like the the lieutenant type. So the why white not women? Not just whites. Why not female babes? Like Craster, I mean, and it's disgusting. He's got like a, a baby milk going here, but he has at this current moment like thirteen wives that probably are capable of giving him children. So why you know take keep taking these new baby girls and not giving them? Like, why is it that girls aren't chosen, I think, is an interesting question about it the makes White me, Walkers. Because, obviously, we don't have a ton of information on the White Walkers or anything to do with them. But if you kind of subscribe to the the Night King who took on a Night's Queen, and she might had might have had something to do with the White Walkers and who who commands them, it could have something to do with power. If are women a, more powerful? Right, maybe the 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 female. That's exactly what I was trying ones to get to. Is, more... is it a power thing in that the White Walkers are afraid of turning a female right. from birth? Because I feel like then they would take command. They would take right. over, and, and it so would be is that. Thing. Is that the way to defeat them? Is are we told right here that like particularly they're not interested in women, and maybe that's the weakness is. A woman's strength, the ability to birth, perhaps. Right. I mean, I think there's something in here that is significant to the White Walkers mythos, and uh, I definitely think it's to do with gender, the the difference in gender. Why for do they sure. take the boys and not the girls when you would think if it's for fluffing their army, it wouldn't fucking matter. And so there's some rule, there's some regulation, there's some reason why they want males. Yeah. Who knows? Anyway, let's get our inductees going in the small council, so we'll convene now and do that. Cool. Small council time! Counseling. Oh, yeah. we're coming, coming in with the, the counseling, counseling, counseling. So, Sam, too, you got an inductee. Yeah, I got an inductee. It's Dude. going to go to Ghost. For finding the dragon glass, because he located it. Um, It's clearly got significance. It's going to get only more and more prominent as we we journey north with Brandon Stark to meet the children and Brendan Rivers do all that shit. So, goes for kicking it all off, getting Sam his first, you know, his first kill on the board. Not even in the chapter. Not even in the chapter. That's a good one. Mine's going to Mormont. Because 
Mormont. Because Mormont, I think, is an actual loss for the world. Um, I think just based on this chapter and what you had said about him listening to Sam, he immediately takes Sam at his word and begins planning around that. We need more dragon glass. That's number one right now. That is priority numero fucking uno besides getting us safely back to the wall. Right. These things ran rampant over us. And what else would he have done had he been given, like, had he been able to make it back to the wall? Like... Right, the Citadel. Right, start right, training. the Citadel. Right, Dragonstone. Like, start training people to make and wield. A hardcore and, search for the library. Right, the things that Sam and Eamon tried. Right, to Sam do, and Eamon, the, the stewards would have been put to that task right. of comb through this any mention of Dragonglass, every single scroll or book in the library. I want poured through. Somewhere along the lines, someone had to know this information, and it was lost, and we need to refind it. And so, yeah, Mormon, because I do think he's a significant loss to the good guys. And so, now we'll get into some listener inductees from you fabulous, wonderful folks, starting with Karen. Uh, just jumping a quick little bit around her email. She says, Craster is the literal worst, and thought uh, Gren is sweet for the way he told Sam that he's thick as a castle wall. But uh, her inductee wants to be Gren for being so pure and unknowingly wise, but it's got to go to the old bear himself. R.I.P. Sorry, your son sucks, but at least he has John there at the end. Someone worth Longclaw. I hope you rest well. And I agree, because I inducted Mormont, that it's a sad death, man. That one, to me, now being an experienced Song of Ice and Fire, you know, member of the community, that hits me worse than Ned does, because it's just that... Mm, Mormon had the smarts to play the game and right, understand right. that sometimes you do just got to kind of suck it up and say, yeah, Craster's sacrificing his kids. We don't have the, the means to deal with that kind of shit right now, so like, let's focus on our stuff. And yes, it's awful. We'll deal with Craster when we can deal with Craster. In the meantime, so. we'll utilize him how we can. So thanks, Karen. Right, and uh, up next we also have Mags wrote in, Mags. and so she had uh, intended to write about John and Jamie, but missed it, and they just didn't hear till the end, uh, because we were combining the two of uh-huh. them. Um, but on Sam, they they mentioned as well the the circle of life thing at the beginning of the chapter here. But their inductee, I've got around here somewhere, it's a long email, was settled in the first few paragraphs, giant, because he is indisputably the man. As a five foot two chick, I don't see many men who are my height, so when I do, solidarity. <laughs> when you're small enough to feasibly pick up as an adult, it can be difficult to be assertive. Giant was having zero of Craster's shit. Hey, guy, nobody asked your opinion. Don't make me climb up there and kick your ass. And then when Brennan died, Giant was the one to cover him up and hope he'd gone somewhere warm. Mm. Plus, he stuck up for Craster's wives and their need for food. He's a solid dude. Didn't appreciate him enough in my previous read reads, which is how we've been with basically all of them. And he dipped out with Ed and right, Greg, right. so is, that's cool. He's chilling with the yeah, cool people. Yeah, he's with the cool posse. Which is good to yep. go. Good news. So thank you for writing Thanks, in. Thanks, Mags. We Thanks, love Karen. It. We always appreciate hearing from you. If you'd like to write in like Karen, like Mags did. Like Stephanie does over on the YouTube, as well as a lot of other new people. Thank you for writing over on the YouTube. You can find us there on YouTube. Search Brotherhood Without Manners. Hey, we've got our playlist for I each of the books. I could have done that one. Uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash without manners, where we're working on getting the next Dunkin' Egg portion out, as well as some just arbitrary shit for, like, when we're sitting around just talking. We might try and put a recorder up, but it's hard, you know, to spur the moment without a portable recording device. So, you know, we're trying to get stuff up there for you guys. Facebook, which you can get access to the private one as well from the Patreon, facebook.com slash Brotherhood Podcast. You can go to our website, brotherhoodwithout.com, where you can just message us there. You can also click on any of the links on the website to find your favorite listening platforms. Email us, withoutmannersbrotherhood at gmail.com. That's where we get a lot of these inductees. I'm on Twitter at Manners Without. Zach's there at Carstark92. Go to all the places, man. Leave us reviews. Rate us. We appreciate it. Rate this podcast.com slash brotherhood. That's hey, a real thing. Yo, cha 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 cha. So yeah. It's all Next good we're stuff. reading Arya Six and the Hound is going to be having a trial by combat versus an undead man. Which is cool because uh Mags had also mentioned in their email the Sandor Azor High 
theory there that is uh, a bit fun to talk about, and right. so maybe we'll have a bit more to mention on that come that chapter. So we'll see what we'll see what goes on. But I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, it's a good one. You got anything else to say? Anything else to add here? Winter comes for us all. Yeah, okay, I think that's it then. Valar de Harris! Peace!